Um, and finally, I'd like to have the great honor and pleasure of introducing Dr. Stanley Fon. Today we have an international expert in movement disorders and truly is known as one of the founding fathers of the movement disorder field. Dr. Fon was the first president of the Movement Disorder Society, which has been renamed the International Parkinson Disease and Movement Disorder Society. So it's an international uh, society. He also founded the World Parkinson Coalition and started a meeting with the novel idea that doctors, researchers, and people with Parkinson's should all get together for scientific meetings. He started the World Parkinson's Congress. Uh, Dr. Fon has been an author on hundreds, more than 500 publications, and several books on Parkinson's and other movement disorders. And it's just truly an honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Stanley Fon. Thank you very much for that introduction, and uh, I'm pleased to be here. I want to thank specifically Chris Hess, one of my former fellows who's now here in the University of Florida's Movement Disorder uh, Division, and uh, his uh, mentor here, uh, Dr. Michael Oaken, head of the Department of Neurology and formerly the head of the Movement Disorder Group. Uh, and he's the, that team's put this all together. It's, it's really great that you can be here. I, I chose for my topic today to talk about uh, misperceptions and if we can have that first slide, yeah. And uh, that people have thought about and made mistakes about. And uh, so I wanted to go over some of those. So um, anyway, what I decided to do is talk about what I consider uh, mistakes, myths, misperceptions uh, that many people, including doctors, make and go over them. And I want this to be very informal. So if you have a question, I'll just raise your hand or just shout question and I'll get to you. Um, so the, I think the number one myth that I hear from uh, so many people when I first see them or they're first diagnosed with Parkinson's is that uh, they hesitate to take cinnamon because they say, well, my cinnamon lasts only five years or levodopa loses its effectiveness after about five years. Uh, how many people here have heard that or felt that themselves or heard it's very common and I don't even know where it's written uh, and I'm going to tell you why I think this mistake was made uh, in a minute uh, before I start though the word cinemet and levodopa I will use intermittently change them they're all the same thing uh, cinemet was the trade name for what we now call carbidopa levodopa the generic name of the two Compounds, carbidopa and levodopa, as you know, levodopa is the important ingredient. Carbidopa is just an enzyme inhibitor that allows more levodopa not to be metabolized in the peripheral circulation so more can get in the brain. Cinnamet was the trade name by Merck when they first prepared this compound. Cinnamet, how did that word come about? Cinnamet, S-I-N-E, cine in Latin means without, then emmet, stands for emesis, vomiting, so without vomiting. That's how the name came about. It's, it's a good name. Uh, everybody knows sentiment now around the world. And um, so we often will use sentiment in place of carpe dopa levodo because it's so much shorter. Okay, so what happens here is that um, levodopa doesn't stop working after five years. It keeps working and working forever. Uh, what happens is that the disease gets worse. Levodopa cinnamon does not stop progression and worsening of the disease. Uh, and new symptoms develop, uh, which levodopa does not correct. So when they see that, they think cinnamon stops working, but it doesn't. It keeps working. And uh, as you see from this slide, the, the top of the, the first top three are, are early symptoms in Parkinson's. Uh, and uh, these are particularly effective by levodopa. And levodopa can help them. Not everybody with tremor will get better maybe, but the bradykinesia, the slowness of movement, which is what bradykinesia means, uh, and rigidity get better. But when the, if the disease advances, and advances in a number of people, and uh, you get the... Uh, Flex posture, uh, 
uh, the body, uh, and then the loss of postural reflex, which is going to lead to falling, and then the freezing of gait. These are common symptoms with advanced stages of Parkinson's. And many people will get this, the great majority. And, and levodopa, unfortunately, doesn't correct it. We don't have really good treatment for these advanced stages of disease. And that's why it's so important that we need to find not only the cause, but how to stop the disease from getting worse. And a lot of researchers in the laboratories are working on it. And what people who have Parkinson's and their families can contribute to this is, is help donate brains after death when they don't need their brain anymore. Let the scientists work and figure out what, why do people who have freezing, what's wrong with the brain? How is it different from those who don't have freezing? This is such an important thing. Uh, so we're not going to make great advances unless we have uh, more brain donations and uh, allow for research to find out the answers of these problems that people will continue to have until we get the answers to them. So um, now, I see that people, um, when does one start levodopa? This is still an unanswered question. Some people, doctors, will start very early. Others will wait until the symptoms are more pronounced. And everything depends on the individual person, how, how bad the symptoms are, what, what they, they have to keep working and they're retired or not working, and when do they want to start. People who have fear of, of levodopa may want to delay it. Those who need to keep working need to take it. Uh, but dopamine agonists are sometimes used as a substitute. You know what a dopamine agonist means? Uh, an agonist is a, a, an agent that works at the dopamine receptor uh, without being levodopa. So it's another chemical compound. These are synthetic compounds that activate the dopamine receptor, just like dopamine does. So levodopa is the precursor, as you know, for dopamine. Le dopamine doesn't get in the brain directly. It's a charged molecule. So levodopa, L-dopa, the precursor is taken by mouth. It gets into the stomach, into the small intestine where it's absorbed, and then it eventually through the bloodstream into the brain and converts to dopamine. And uh, then it acts as the dopamine receptors. Of course, it acts every dopamine receptor in the brain. Dopamine agonists are sort of a substitute. They're an artificial compound that can act at the dopamine receptors. They have their own side effects, but a lot of, they don't cause some of the side effects like dyskinesias, and so some people take it. But it is not well tolerated. Agonists are not well tolerated in the elderly population. And uh, I, as a rule, I tend not to use agonists in anybody over the age of 70. In fact, most neurologists now are using less and less dopamine agonists as we're finding more and more side effects, including side effects in young people, side effects like impulse control disorders, falling asleep without warning, including while driving. So things like this are, are not good. You can get other problems, drop in blood pressure, on standing, ankle edema, you can get problems of, uh, uh, fall, uh, of daytime drowsiness. So el older people do not tolerate that drug well, and cinnamon is a much better drug for them. The time to use dopamine agonists is a young person. Um, people, let's say, in their 40s, um, maybe even in their 50s, who are going to get these dyskinesias, you might delay it by starting a dopamine agonist. So uh, I've seen people prescribed dopamine agonist to an elderly person at the, over the age of 70, and it's just, to me, not the best thing to do because of the potential side effects, including hallucinations. Um, another drug called Stilevo. Uh, I've seen doctors start that drug. Now, what is Stilevo? Stilevo is basically cinnamon plus uh, enticapone. Enticapone is another drug inhibiting another enzyme. The enzyme converts dopa, the medicine you take, L-dopa, into a methylated dopa. So it puts a methyl group on it, and therefore it's less available for dopa to get into the brain and um, form dopamine. So, uh, and what, what enticapone and stilevo is good for, it prolongs the half-life of levodopa in the, in the plasma, in the bloodstream. So, you don't. You have less of the wearing off effect. It extends the life a little bit. Of, so it is a good drug, but you, you don't need it in the early stages of treatment. 
L-DOPA has a long duration benefit in the early stages of treatment, and it's not necessary. And when you take Stilibu, it's more likely to get the dyskinesias because it tends to elevate the blood level. So, for example, in this slide here, if you look at the, this is a, a graph, and just, if you look at the bottom line, So this is the duration. These are in weeks. So this is one year, two years, three years, four years. And these are the number of subjects still in the study. Uh, and you can see that by the fourth year, fifth year, uh, uh, very few. So this part of the curve is not accurate. But what this curve, this is a called a survival curve, uh, also named after the originators of this Captain Meyer curve and uh, biostatisticians. And at, the, at one means uh, there's no dyskinesia. Uh, and zero means 100% dyskinesia. So this means there's, so there's no dyskinesia. And over time, here's what happens with carbidopa, levodopa. It, you get dyskinesias over time. And by five years or so, you get about 40% or so will have dyskinesias. But with the, the Stilevo, when you have NT component as well, it's faster rate of getting dyskinesia. So, most people don't need Stilevo right away, and it's better to delay it until you need it. So that's another potential problem for some people. Okay. Um, it, it does help the off time if you do have wearing off, however, and so it is a useful drug in, in the complicated cases. Um, this is what I talked about earlier about getting uh, motor complications from levodopa, uh, particularly young people, but even, even senior citizens can get it. And this is wearing off. This is called clinical fluctuations or motor fluctuations and dyskinesias. Dyskinesias is, again, a Greek or Latin term for abnormal movements. Uh, and these are very common. As you can see in that last slide, where I showed you the capital Meyer curve, most of the people over time will get dyskinesias. Well, young onset Parkinson's uh, are much more likely than older people with Parkinson's at onset to get uh, dyskinesias. Um, this is a curve that um, was from some colleagues in, in London. They looked at people who had age at onset less than f age 40. And you can see over time here, even after two years, about 50% already had dyskinesias. And by five years, 100% dyskinesias and wearing off of motor fluctuations. So young people are more likely to get it. These are the young people. And this graph uh, from uh, some colleagues in you then you call Yugoslavia, now Serbia, uh, looked at their young onset, again, age onset 21 to 40, uh, against those age onset greater than 40. Again, this is a Kaplan-Meier curve, but the curve goes the other way. This means no dyskinesias and no fluctuations, and this means 100%. Uh, so again, young people at a faster rate, they get both fluctuations and dyskinesias. Red's the dyskinesias, the yellow's the, the fluctuations. And here is, again, uh, the older people are much slower rate of getting it. So older people can get it, but it takes longer. So for the young people, if you start levodopa too soon, they're bound to get it. And so you're buying time uh, by delaying levodopa therapy in the young people. You don't have to delay it so much in older onset. How, how many people in this room had their Parkinson's before the age of 50. So just a handful, maybe certainly about five or six. Well, as you know, uh, Parkinson's is a disease that the incidence increases with age. The older you are, the more likely people are gonna get Parkinson's. And, um, but those who have younger onset are more prone to get these uh, fluctuations and dyskinesias. Okay, um, so uh, I went through that slide already. Uh, now, I also see another concern by many patients when I f they first hear about getting 
Parkinson's and they worry about levodopa. Again, I talked about the first myth. They think it's not going to last and therefore they, have, they want to save it till later. Uh, some people want to save it so long that they let themselves become disabled. Levodopa is actually a miraculous drug. You don't know what it was like in the days before levodopa. People, they were already advanced Parkinson's almost after about five or six years of the disease. They were struggling, uh, already using canes or, or walkers, uh, and they didn't survive nearly as long. I mean, now the death rate has dropped almost to normal uh, with levodopa. Uh, and they stay able and functional for a long time, yet the disease still progresses. But it turns out that uh, you're probably moving the disease back about five years. You're buying about five years when you start levodopa. It's a great drug, uh, and we're certainly glad to have it. And the person who really developed it as a treatment, George Conscious, won the Lasker Award uh, in the year that he showed that L-dopa works. Um, and, uh, that was in 1969. Uh, but some people still are fearful. They're fearful about getting dyskinesias. They're fearful the drug may not work. I already got rid of the myth about not working. Uh, but dyskinesias does do occur, and it will occur over, eventually over time. But if you wait too long, it'll, it will, it'll take a shorter period of time on levodopa to get it. Uh, but uh, so you shouldn't be that fearful. At some point, everybody will need levodopa. And uh, it's, it's a timing, is, again, as I told you, is individualized between the doctor and the, and the person who has Parkinson's disease to decide when's the best time for that person to get it. Okay. Now, one of the concerns that many um, scientists had, including myself at one time, was could L-DOPA itself hasten the worsening of the disease. Yes, it treats the symptoms, it replaces the missing dopamine, uh, but could it possibly worsen the disease faster? And uh, so we developed a study with the Parkinson study group to test this and to determine that. Why, and of course, why would we even think that? L-DOPA might be harmful, but because L-DOPA, uh, by making dopamine, too much dopamine in the brain, uh, when dopamine gets oxidized, it, it can form what we call free radicals, um, and uh, they can be harmful to the brain. So we were worried if too much dopamine in the brain might be harmful, and so we were worried could L-DOPA be doing that. So a study was designed to test that called the L-DOPA trial, um, and it was where People were early, newly diagnosed, all ages, and either placed on placebo, no medicine, or different doses of levodopa, and followed for nine months, and then washed out, and then measured again for the severity of Parkinson's disease. And we found just the opposite. Instead of L-dopa making Parkinson's worse after it was washed out of the body, they were still better than those treated with placebo. Uh, and that was very important, and that allowed many doctors, including myself, to start levodopa earlier than we would, because that concern of, um, of hastening the disease uh, is less in our, our minds now. And I'll show you the graph for that. This is the graph from the L-dopa study. And again, this is number of weeks, 40 weeks was the end of the study, nine months. Uh, and then we washed out the drug and measured them a week later and then another week later. So two weeks of washout. And this sc scale here is the UPDRS, the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, which all your doctors measure when, for the, quantifying the severity of your Parkinson's disease. And the greater the score, the worse the disease, the worse the symptoms and signs of the disease. And what this thing does, this is the change uh, of either worsening of the score or improvement of the score. So when you start L-DOPA, the score gets better. And you can see the dose matters. 150 milligrams a day, that's 50 milligrams three times a day. Do 300 milligrams a day and 600 milligrams. You can see the greater the dose, the, the better the reduction of the severity of Parkinson's over time. Uh, the placebo group in red, uh, again, there's a little, placebo effect here, there was no worsening, but otherwise it's rather linear 
worsening of the scores. And uh, then the washout occurred, and there was a little dip because everybody knew they were being stopped their drug, whatever it was. And uh, but it keeps on going on. Meantime, the other drugs they were better because they were on drug. When the drug was stopped, uh, they didn't get worse worse than placebo. They stayed better than placebo. So there's no evidence clinically that levodopa hastens the disease progression. Uh, there are concerns, however. Some people th thought, well, maybe uh, the drug stays around much longer, the effect of the drug, and two weeks washout isn't enough. And so there's still some uncertainty about it. And also there's a little bit of uncertainty that uh, a neuroimaging component of the disease uh, suggests there may be uh, some increased dopamine cell loss. Uh, and so th this study, although very important study uh, is not 100% clear. Um, this is essentially what a DAT scan is. This is a, a scan to measure uh, the integrity of the dopamine nerve terminals. And you can see the placebo group, it gets worse about 1.5%. But if you're on L-DOPA, it gets worse much more. And that suggests, gee, is L-DOPA really worsening the disease? But we don't see it clinically because then the effect was still long-lasting clinical benefit. Uh, or could this be because the L-DOPA that people are taking when the, the DAT scan was done uh, interfered with the DAT scan test and, and, and blocking the uptake of that uh, agent that they were measuring from the, from the DAT scan? And that is still uncertain. In animals, it doesn't look like L-DOPA interferes, but we don't know about in humans, and th therefore, there's a little uncertainty. To try to answer the question, we tried to do another study, but NIA said, no, this was sufficient and um, we couldn't do any more. They wouldn't give us the money. So we don't know the full answer. But the net, the bottom line is almost all scientists and all clinicians believe from the L-DOPA study that L-DOPA, there's no evidence, hard evidence that L-DOPA hastens the progression of the disease and therefore it's safer to give even earlier. Okay. Um, after this study, some sign, uh, clinicians thought, well, gee, maybe if you gave any symptomatic drug, you would do well. Uh, in other words, uh, L-DOPA looks like it did well, but um, when you stopped it, uh, but what about other drugs? Well, it turns out that it turns, uh, the, the belief was that if you treat the give them some drug that acts on the dopamine receptors, you're gonna change the physiology of the brain and they're gonna get better. It turns out that not to be the case. This was tested in Pramipexol, which is Meripex. Does anybody know, you don't know what that is? That's, uh, you know, dopamine agonist. And Risagiline, which is uh, Azelect. Uh, they showed no benefit. That's a two milligram dose of Azelect. Uh, the one milligram did show some benefit. But what, and this is a typical graph. This is, uh, in clinical trial terms known as a delayed start. At the beginning of the study, I don't know, my pen isn't working well. Maybe, does this have a pointer? Hmm. And I did something wrong. Um, oh, here we go. So here at the start of the study, and the phase out, I guess the battery's gone. Um, we can see that um, People were started either on Pramipex or Smiripex in red, and they get better. This is UPDRS change again, and they get better, and slowly it worsens. And the blue ones were started on placebo, and again, there was a little bit of delay worsening, of so-called placebo response, and then they started getting worse. And at nine months, and all the patients, the doctors knew that nine months, everybody would be switched to Pramipexol. So the blue ones, So the blue ones were delayed start, and when they finally got started, they get better also. Oh, oh the center button. Mm -hmm. I can't see it even. There it is. Uh, it doesn't work on the white. Uh, anyway, you can see the blue one up here. Uh, they did get better about the same rate as when you started. But you see at the end, they caught up with each other. There was no stopping at the progression of the disease. It doesn't matter if you start early or you start late, Mirapex. 
you end up the same. So you can delay Mirabix and start it, you'll come up the same as if you started early. We don't know if that's the same for L-DOPA, for levodopa. We try to have the government, NIH, give us funds to do this for levodopa, uh, and they didn't. Uh, and maybe they're sorry now, but uh, we couldn't get it out of the NIH review committee uh, to test it. We came up with this design, and the drug companies took the design and did it for Azelec. They did it for as well. But it's not 100% certain. And uh, because we didn't do that study, we don't know for a fact. And there was one study that was done that suggested it may be better to start earlier, and that's called the COMPD study. This is a study where people who had Parkinson's disease, and they were uh, ready to be treated, and they were given, a, a, entering that study, to, to be assigned randomly to whether they start Pramipexol, Meripex, or they start Levodopa. And the idea of the study, sponsored by the drug company, was to show that if you start Pramipexol, you're going to less likely to have dyskinesias and wearing off. And that, that's the case. Agonists cause less of that. Um, but uh, what we also saw in the study that L-DOPA was definitely more powerful. The bottom curve is the improvement in the UPDRS scores was better for levodopa than for Pramipexol. And during the study, after about the first 12 months, if a patient wasn't doing well, uh, they and the doctors treating them could add on open-label L-DOPA. So if you were taking Pramipexol blindedly, you don't know what drug you're on, uh, and then you needed something more, they would give you L-DOPA. Uh, if you're on L-DOPA blindedly and you don't know what you're on and you need more, you would take more L-DOPA. Basically, you, you're just adding L-DOPA to whatever you were on. And despite that, uh, the people who started first with L-DOPA continue to do better, and this is a four-year follow-up. Uh, than those who had started with the agonists. So that suggests that L-DOPA may have some protective effect, uh, and they, they do better. And uh, that's why it may be important for some people to start earlier. Um, this is a six-year follow-up from the same group. But you see, four years, this uh, was uh, good. And then by six years, they caught up with each other. So even if you start Pramipexol or an agonist first, eventually, because the disease worsens and so forth, you end up being in the same boat after about six years. So maybe in the earlier years, you're a little bit less Parkinson if you have L-DOPA than the Pramipexol, but by the end, you're probably in the same place. The point is the disease gets worse, as you all know, and this is what we have to fight, and we have to find a cure for it. Um, okay, um, because an agonist starting early doesn't cause the dyskinesias and the wearing off like L-DOPA does. What if you gave an agonist and L-DOPA together when you start treatment? It turns out that's not a good idea. It just gives you more likelihood that the L-DOPA is going to be even more powerful. Uh, it's like when you add an anticapone uh, or if you add an MAO and B inhibitor, uh, you make it more powerful, more easy to get the dyskinesias. So uh, we don't do that. Uh, we usually use one or the other, but sometimes you have to use together because uh, you get side effects from one, you have to add the other drug uh, to help compensate for when you reduce the first drug. This is an, a study similar to the COMPD study, but this is a requip, ropinerol study, where uh, patients, again, needed medicine, they were blindedly randomized to requip. Re Ropinerol, a dopamine agonist versus levodopa, and then followed to see when they get dyskinesias. And uh, if you look on the upper left, uh, you can see this again, a kaplan meier curve, no dyskinesias at the top. As the time goes on, this is a five-year study, uh, you can see that they get uh, uh, dyskinesias eventually in the L-dopa. That's the, the bottom of the two curves up there. Uh, those who started on ropinerol, requip, get their dyskinesias late. And after the study was published, the scientists who did that study went back and looked at the data, because not everybody who started with Requip eventually needed additional L-DOPA. Some stayed on Requip alone, and others added L-DOPA. And so they divided that group into two, those who never needed L-DOPA in the upper right. 
you can see those who stayed on Requip all the time without any L-DOPA never got dyskinesia practically, only a couple of percent. Uh, if for those people who started on Requip who needed L-DOPA, and then you set the clock back to when L-DOPA started, you can see on the bottom right that the two graphs overlap each other. Forget the bottom part of the the far right of the curve, because there's too few patients left over. But in the beginning, you see the overlap. So basically what it does, once you start L-DOPA, you start the clock to possibly getting dyskinesias. What that study shows. So if you can take an agonist or stay on MLB inhibitor for several years and before you start L-DOPA, you're delaying the start of when the, L the dyskinesias may occur. Um, so th that's what you're doing. You're buying some time for that. Okay. So, that, but you don't take them together. Taking them together won't give you any advantage at all. Um, okay, so we went through that. Uh, now I'm gonna talk about other issues besides what I see on people starting out, and this uh, 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 deep brain stimulation. Some people have advanced disease where they're falling, uh, their balance is bad, they're freezing of gait, these are not symptoms that deep brain stimulation help, and therefore they're not good candidates. The ideal candidate, and you can hear more about DBS, of course, later this morning, are those who respond to L-DOPA, but they get the dyskinesias wearing off, so you can get smoother. You can sort of get what I call electronic DOPA. Uh, you get a smooth of the response. So you're stimulating basically the dopamine pathway uh, continuously, even though you're bypassing DOPA main pathway, but it's like electronic dopa. That's the way to look at it. Uh, the one symptom that doesn't respond that, to del dopa, like tremor sometimes does not respond, maybe 20 to 30% of people, it can still respond to the deep brain stimulation. So that's still a good one. But almost everything else, if the symptom doesn't respond with, with the best del dopa treatment, then it's not gonna respond with DBS. On the other hand, if you can't take enough del dopa, because let's say you have postural hypotension, uh, and you can't just take it, or you have side effects, your stomach doesn't tolerate it and so forth, well then deep brain stimulation may be uh, another way to go. This is not bad. So it is a very important, valuable tool. And two years ago, the Lasker Award was given to two of the pioneers for deep brain stimulation work. Uh, it was a very important advance in, in Parkinson's disease. But you have to be the right person for it. Uh, age is probably not such a big factor, even though younger people can tol tolerate surgery better than older people. Uh, it's the matter of the, what the symptoms are is the problem. Um, there is something that I see many doctors miss uh, and has been given the name dopamine dysregulation syndrome. This is a, a person who has Parkinson's that keeps taking more L-DOPA all day long. They need it, they feel miserable, they take another dose and they feel better. So they become, quote, dopa addicts. Um, and people thought, well, this is some dysregulation of the dopamine system, but I don't think that at all. What I think it is, is these people have something called non-motor offs. Uh, I'll show you another slide in a minute about what non-motor offs are, but basically they're, their feelings of anxiety, depression, uh, uh, feeling ill, uh, have to go to the bathroom all the time, uh, feeling uncomfortable. Uh, this is where the dopamine receptors in the non-motor areas, and called the limbic area, which are the emotional areas of the brain, the cortical areas, the thinking areas of the brain. There are dopamine receptors there, and they're no longer being activated. They go off, whereas the motor, the basal ganglia dopamine um, the striatal dopamine receptors are still on. Or the striatal dopamine receptors will be off at the same time, so you'll have motor offs and non-motor offs simultaneously. But some people have non-motor offs all by themselves. They have a craving, and they find they get relief when they take L-DOPA again. And uh, these are some of the symptoms. Um, and I don't know, maybe some of you in this audience have them. They have periods of the day when they'll get pain, restlessness, I'm looking at the left-hand column, depression, anxiety, terrible feeling uh, in their body, dysphoria, panic feelings, uh, drenching sweats, abdominal bloating, dyspnea, uh, shortness of breath, uh, have to go to the bathroom frequently, 
this is, uh, these are non-motor symptoms in Parkinson's, and when the, those non-motor dopamine receptors are not activated, people will get these symptoms, and they take another pill of L-dopa, and they get better again. Uh, and this could be treated. I mean, you can use continuous dopa uh, infusions intestinally, or you can perhaps use uh, deep brain stimulation and use lower doses of L-dopa and uh, so forth. I mean, there may be ways to treat this. It's not so clear cut how good deep brain stimulation is for this, but uh, so I think people have to realize that, and this is often overlooked, they're thinking something's wrong with the person's psychologically, but it's not. It's, it's how the dopamine receptors are uh, not functioning properly in other parts of the brain. Um, so, uh, so that was the bottom line, where the arrow is up here. Um, okay, another thing, cinnamon or carbidopa levodopa comes in different doses. The most common dose is the 25 slash 100 milligrams. As you know, it's 25 milligrams stands for carbidopa, the 100 milligrams for levodopa. The second number is the important number, the amount of levodopa. There's also a 25 slash 250, so it's 250 milligrams of levodopa. But there's also the 10 slash 100s. Has anybody here taking 10 100s? No, it's very uncommon uh, to use it today, and there's no reason to use it. But some, I've seen some doctors, when the person has, let's say, dyskinesias, or overdose symptoms of dopa, uh, they'll think they're lowering the dose by giving it 10 100 instead of a 25 100 and in no way reduces the amount of levodopa. All it does is reduce the amount of carbidopa, which doesn't do that much. You just get less nausea, vomiting, than if you get more carbidopa. It doesn't do anything for being overdosed or not. So I just wanted to point that out, but no one here is taking the 10-100s anyway. Okay, well, that's good. Uh, you have good doctors. Um, another thing I've seen from other doctors, they, they put a patient on let's say the 25, 100 milligrams of levodopa sentiment, and um, they get up the dose maybe to three times a day, and they don't see improvement. Uh, I don't know, maybe you have some other form of Parkinson's, you're not getting better. And then they come, I see them, and they're just underdosed. They weren't, everybody has a different dose that works for that person. And it's up to the doctor to, and the patient together to find that right dose. So if 300 milligrams a day doesn't work, I build the dose up, maybe 600 milligrams the next plateau, that doesn't work, maybe 900 and so forth. What is the maximum? I guess I would go up to 2,000 milligrams a day. Either it works or you had side effects on the way up that limits you. And if it doesn't work in 2,000, it's probably not gonna work and maybe you have some other form of Parkinsonism called atypical Parkinsonism, also called Parkinson plus syndromes. But you need, to find the right dose for, the, for every person. No nope, two people are, are necessarily alike, and everybody has to have their own dose figured out work, working with their doctor. Um, there's another form of cinnamon with the trade name of Parcopa. Uh, it's now generic, but what Carcopa is is nothing more than cinnamon formula in such a way that it dissolves in your mouth, so in the saliva of your mouth. And, um, what is its advantage? Well, it doesn't get absorbed through the tongue or the mucous membranes of the mouth. No, it gets dissolved in the saliva, and when you swallow your saliva, it gets into the stomach just like regular tablets of cinnamon does. But at least it's now in liquid form in your stomach and can be gone into the small intestine and get absorbed from there. So a person who may have trouble swallowing uh, and can't take a lot of food or something but can swallow their own saliva, they can still take par parcopa or similar drug like that. Or let's say after surgery where they're not allowed to eat anything or drink water, but they're certainly gonna swallow their saliva, they can use something like Parcopa. They can still get their levodopa that way. Uh, so it's an, it was an important advance to be able to take levodopa that way. Um, stopping L-dopa suddenly is not a good idea. You can cause rebound worsening, worse symptoms your Parkinson, uh, and uh, I would not, so never, always try to taper. This is a powerful drug. It's changed the 
brain chemistry and you have to taper it down. You taper it down, it's very safe to lower dose of levodopa. But you never want to stop it suddenly. And so something called the neuroleptic malignolite syndrome is the name the neurologists have given it. And uh, it, you can get fever, confusion, uh, stiff muscles, and so forth. And uh, so uh, one wants to avoid that. A common drug that internists and gastroenterologists use for people who have some nausea or some vomiting or bowel symptoms of any sort, they use a drug known by its trade name Reglan, which is metoclopramide, the generic name. Uh, the problem with this drug for people who have Parkinson's, this is drug is, works as a dopamine receptor blocker. Uh, and uh, it can interfere in the brain of, of L-dopa working. It's like antipsychotic drugs, which block dopamine receptors. And this is the same class of drug. So uh, we, we, one has to be careful when a person is seeing that they're internist and they put them on Reglan that it may interfere with their L-dopa working. So you don't want to use it. Just like you don't want to use these classical antipsychotics, the same thing. Um, and that's in this slide. Uh, there are a couple of antipsychotics on the market that don't have this severe worsening of Parkinson's when you add these dopamine receptor blockers for treating psychosis. Uh, quetiapine, which is Seroquel, and clozapine, which is Clozaril. Uh, but, and they could be effective, but just last Friday a week ago, eight days ago, April 30th, the FDA approved a new antipsychotics specifically designed to treat the psychosis seen in Parkinson patients. Now people can get psychosis and Parkinson from the disease itself or from their drugs. The dopamine agonists, cinnamon, amantadine, MAOB inhibitors, uh, susceptible people can get hallucinations, paranoia, delusions. And so we're looking for drugs. And this one drug on the bottom line, pimavanserin, was just approved by the FDA. It does not block dopamine receptors. It works through a different mechanism. And it will become available in the drugstores within a, probably a couple of months. And uh, will be tried on our patients to see how really effective it is. Hopefully, it is effective and safe. And, but only by using it will we know for sure. Uh, so that is something good. This is a very important niche drug. The old days, before we had a, even quetiapine or, or or clozapine uh, to treat psychosis, we had to stop or lower the dose of the cinnamon, and then the, all the motor symptoms of Parkinson's get worse. Uh, with these anti antipsychotics are tolerated by the people with Parkinson's, then we don't have to stop the levodopa, and we can keep the Parkinson's treated, at the same time treat their psychosis. So it's, it's going to be an important advance. Um, there's a number of Parkinsonologists, Parkinson specialists who think, oh, the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's are worse than the motor symptoms. Uh, and some are, that's true for some of them. For example, if you get dementia, no matter if you had Parkinson's or no Parkinson's, dementia is a bad thing to have. We all know that, and we all worry about it as we get older. Um, and certainly, uh, that is a non-motor symptom of Parkinson that would be worse than motor. Uh, but there are many other non-motor symptoms that are not as bad. Uh, being able to get out of the chair, be able to go to the, walk to the bathroom, get out of bed, uh, the motor symptoms, freezing, falling, all that are definitely worse than many of the non-motor symptoms. So it's not uniform that non-motor symptoms are worse than motor. Probably early motor symptoms are treated. That's why they're not so bad. Before we had L-dopa, when you couldn't treat them, uh, the motor symptoms were the things that bothered the patients. Once you treated the motor symptoms, certainly in the early stages of Parkinson's, then the non-motor symptoms become prominent. So both are important, uh, and not one is not necessarily worse than the other. There are other drugs that were, that were around uh, that are not dopamine, like amantadine and what the generic name, trihexyphenidyl, artane is a trade name. Uh, these are uh, anticholinergic drugs, they act on the acetylcholine system, they block that system. Those drugs are useful in Parkinson's, but they're not really good for people beyond the age of at least 70, maybe even a little younger. Uh, Artane can affect memory. 
uh, and we, we don't want, it's bad enough when we get older to have mem mem poor memory. Uh, we don't need anything to make it worse. And amantadine can cause hallucinations and other problems. So these are used more with caution in elderly people. Uh, but younger patients can tolerate these, and these could be a useful addition to treat younger people with Parkinson's. Um, the doses of monamine oxidase B inhibitors, the two out there are selegiline and risagiline. Risagiline's trade name is Azelec. Uh, these are useful drugs, but they work as an MAOB inhibitor only if the dose is kept to, to a certain level. If you go over that dose, it inhibits the enzyme monamine oxidase type A, MAOA, instead of MAOB, not just MAOB. So at the dose we use prescribed, it's only MAOB being inhibited, and that is safe. You don't have to worry about what used to be called the cheese effect, which is only if you inhibit the A enzyme. So make sure you don't overdose yourself on the MAOB inhibitors. So for selegiline, uh, you want to go no more than 10 milligrams a day. That's the third uh, white row. Um, Selegiline does have a potential side effect if you take it late in the day of causing insomnia, so we never want to use selegiline late in the day, and uh, we don't give it past lunchtime. We try to give it in the morning if possible. Uh, so, but anyway, these drugs are useful. They hit potentiate L-DOPA to make it better, uh, but they can have, as I say, some, their own side effects, and don't go overdosing on them. Always keep the dose in mind when you use any of these powerful drugs. Um, it's not uncommon that people who have a depression with Parkinson's, that's because it's not just dopamine reduction that's lost, but also uh, serotonin and norepinephrine in the brain. And uh, when these can cause depression, anxiety, and so forth, then they need to be treated. So you have antidepressant medicines, anti-anxiety medicines you have to use in those people with, who have those symptoms with Parkinson's. L-DOPA doesn't treat those symptoms. Uh, but sometimes when you add, you want to add an SSRI, uh, that's a serotonin selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, an antidepressant. Uh, if you're already on an MEOB inhibitor, the drugstore has a pharmacist has a list of conflicting drugs and say you can't take them together. But what I tell my patients is that the drug is going to tell you that, but just tell the drug as your doctor says, it's okay to take it as long as you don't take more than the 10 milligrams a day of selegiline or the one milligram a day of Hazelec. Uh, and you're safe because it doesn't inhibit the A enzyme, uh, the monamine, monamine oxidase A enzyme. So, but that's a common problem what we see. Um, depression, as I said, is common. Uh, it's easy to miss. Doctors have to recognize the patient is right and be treated because it is a treatable condition. Um, and there are a lot of good antidepressants. REM sleep behavior disorder, moving in your dreams, moving while in REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. Very common in people with Parkinson's, not everybody has it. Some people get REM sleep before they get Parkinson's. Some people get REM sleep behavior disorder after they get Parkinson's. Uh, but it, it can be treated, and it's important because it's, the patient doesn't know that he's doing it. It's the bed partner, so the spouse gets beaten up because the patient is wildly moving their dreams. So that's treatable. You don't want the spouse to move out of bed, right? Uh, and so. We, we want to treat it. So you have to recognize it. And the person to ask is the bed partner. So if the spouse comes with the patient to the doctor's office, the doctor should ask the, the question uh, in front of the spouse and then treat it. Clonazepam bedtime is a very good drug. Melatonin is also helpful too. Um, I've often heard when DBS first came out that DBS is going to be the cure to Parkinson's. Well, we all know it's not the cure. It's another symptomatic treatment. It's certainly good in the right patient. I've already talked about it. You're going to have your own little session on DBS later. Restless leg syndrome. Discomfort in your legs, usually at the end of the day and certainly in the night. You have to walk around to get relief. Fairly common in Parkinson's, more common in Parkinson's than in other conditions. Uh, and uh, it needs to be treated. Uh, sometimes our dopamine agonists and L-DOPA cause augmentation and a worsening of the restless legs. So in those cases, we have to use uh, what's called an opioid, uh, uh, a little bit, a small dose of an opiate uh, that controls it very well, and it's not addicting. Uh, and so, uh, but it's a very common. Anybody here have restless legs syndrome with their Parkinson? Yeah. 
And uh, usually they'll try treating with a dopamine agonist or L-dopa, but if that doesn't work, a little opioid uh, really does help. Um, okay, I'm gonna skip these motor complications. I'm gonna go to the uh, third from the last, like my time has run out, uh, and I wanna get to the, the very end of my talk. Uh, I knew I was going to burn late. I put more slides usually in than I can finish, and so don't worry about it. These were, so I'm going to end, end up with this slide and, and the video to follow. The World Parkinson Congress. First of all, has anybody heard of it? Anybody ever been to one? Okay, there's one. And you, you will attest that this is the greatest thing going. I mean, people who go uh, just love it. They come away enthused. They know what's happening in the field of Parkinson's disease treatment and research. This is a meeting, it's every three years. It's where people, patients with Parkinson's, their family members, the clinicians, the basic scientists, the nurses, their interest in Parkinson's, the physical therapists, speech therapists, occupational therapists, all get together uh, every three years. It's a three-day meeting. This year it's in September in Portland, Oregon. The dates are there. Uh, well, it's probably hard to see out there, but uh, middle of September. And um, you can go online, wpc2016.org, uh, to get the information. You can see the program. Uh, I really encourage anybody, even if you use a walker, if you feel you can make the trip to Portland, uh, there's a nominal registration fee, a number of meals are provided, you get to go all the sessions. But you can hear in the big plenary sessions where everybody's together in one big auditorium, the speakers usually have some scientists talking, some patients talking, and so forth. And they can talk about different topics like genetics. They can talk about the progression of the disease. They can talk about the cognitive things. And they have small parallel sessions and workshops uh, it's talking about different topics. And you get to meet all kinds of people. It's really good. And a videotape was made of that. Uh, from the 2013 uh, session, and if we're going to show the video now. The World Parkinson Coalition, when it was founded, it was founded with the idea that we needed to create a new blueprint for a meeting. We couldn't continue to just have researchers meeting researchers and clinicians meeting clinicians. We needed to actually open the doors, bring researchers who often never meet a person with Parkinson's and bring people with Parkinson's who often never meet a researcher into the same space. The idea is this cross-pollination is going to generate new ideas, allow for interaction. You know, people with Parkinson's live with the disease 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. They, in their own rights, are experts. They have a lot to share. And obviously, the people in the labs are looking at this at a molecular level. They may never see how it actually affects a person on a daily basis. So bringing them, bringing them together allows for more opportunities of this sort of, this sort of education. And we hope that that sort of interaction and that, no, that will bring out a novel idea and hopefully the next step to a cure. Another area we've had, every Congress we've had from the beginning is called the Renewal Room. So if you need a break from the heavy science, you can go sit down for a class, or not sit down, for a class of yoga. The purpose of this is to bring everybody working with Parkinson together. No other time before the first World Parkinson Congress had this been done. We've now in the third World Parkinson Congress. Each one has been more successful than the previous one. They're going to learn from it. The more you know, the more you realize how complex Parkinson is, but the more you can learn from other people and also help yourself. So I think the person who's got Parkinson will help themselves. And, and I'm a teacher, I'm a, a therapist, I take care of patients, I'm a researcher. I want to learn, so it's important to me, but I also want to convey information to everybody who should know something about Parkinson's, uh, who are involved with Parkinson's. So I think this is... Uh, the only meaning of its type, and it's really important. And so we create what we call a roundtable, or meet the expert, where basically either physicians, clinicians, uh, researchers, or patients can sit with an expert in a given field and maybe be a little bit more personalized type of interaction with that expert.
I think people with Parkinson's need to speak out. You often find it's a very lonely condition and some people are frightened to speak out. I'm not one of those and I think I can put my voice over to explain the condition and look out for what's best for people with the condition. And I'm looking for best practice, whatever we can get that I can take back, that our people can learn from and make lives more comfortable. It's been a trip worthwhile. Parkinson's is a, is a much more complex disease than we initially thought it was. Um, but it is um, a disease that will eventually be cured. There will be better treatments and, and, they're, and they're looming in our future. Um, it's just a matter of time and all the stakeholders need to just continue and persevere. And by working together, we, we will achieve that one day. But until that time, it's really important for patients to learn to live well with the disease, to remain productive and engaged and independent, essentially. To a foundation like my own, if I was saying why they should be part of the World Parkinson Congress, I would say because it is a unique opportunity to present who you are and what you do to the world community. There is nothing else like it. There are other world conferences, other world conferences representing science or clinical medicine or communications or one piece of the conversation, it could be training programs for nurses or for physical therapists. In the World Parkinson Congress, all of those constituencies are present. Not just one, not just two, but all of them. So it's a unique opportunity for foundations to show what they do, who they are, and to um, build support for their programs. A number of people have come up and commented on the increasing engagement of the Parkinson community. And we're now looking at not only covering the latest uh, papers in the area, but really trying to engage in general. This year there has been a policy forum to really try and change the way that the world looks at Parkinson's disease. You're talking about the rate of progression and the rate of progression worsens in different people, but in general, uh, the best evidence of what a given, given person is is what their past has been, has been moving slowly, it's going to continue to move slowly. There are some people who have a certain genetic forms of Parkinson's disease, or what I call malignant Parkinson's, that they rapidly progress in over three or four years. Uh, probably nobody in this room has that. That's a very rare form of Parkinson's. But the rate does vary from one person to another. And uh, not everybody gets advanced disease. Some people have a nice slow disease. Uh, but it, it is very, uh, the thing is, uh, we have treatments for almost every stage of the disease. For, for complications or not. The, the biggest problems we don't have good treatments for are the balance, the inability to catch yourself if, if you lose your balance. And the other problem is freezing of gait. That is difficulty when your feet stick to the ground, even when the medicine is working. When the medicine off and you have it, we can treat it by keeping you on. But if the medicine is on and you're still freezing that, we don't have good treatment for it. People are looking. They're looking for different targets for deep brain stimulation for it, and they're trying new drugs for it. But we don't have There's still unanswered questions in part, no question about it. Yes, OK. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your meeting.